Well, hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us on this really amazing uh, panel that we've got together tonight. I am Ed Kramer. I am the chair of the SIGGRAPH Pioneers Group. If you want to see some of the things that we have done, this is the fifth panel that we've done. We have a panel called the Pioneers of Analog Animation. We've done a panel called Chasing Pixels, the Pioneering Graphics Processors. We've done a panel on the Pioneers of Digital Art and Animation, along with the digital arts community of SIGGRAPH. And uh, we did a panel on the Pioneers of CGI education. If you want to see any of these, they're all available online. All you have to do is Google SIGGRAPH Pioneers, and that will take you to our page on the SIGGRAPH website. And on that page, there is a um, online contents link, and that'll give you the links to all of the things we've done. We've done, uh, in addition to those panels, we've done interviews with former chairs of the SIGGRAPH conference. We've done a number of those. We've done interviews with a, a lot of pretty amazing people. Those interviews are available there. Um, and so there's a lot of things that we've done as uh, computer graphics pioneers. So without further ado, I really want to get to tonight's really amazing panel. And our moderator for the panel is our own Dr. Bill Joel. So Bill, why don't you take it away and introduce yourself and then you can introduce our panelists to the group tonight. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, yeah, this is gonna be a fabulous panel tonight. I can't wait to hear this. Um, of course, like everybody else who's probably uh, listening in as an attendee, we have all heard about generative AI, generative AI, and oh my God, all the, you know, the, the pictures that are going out there, Taylor Swift, et cetera. <laughs> What does it mean? And we're going to try and piece it apart and make you even more confused than you were before. No, we're going to try to help you out. But I'm Bill Joel, and I'm a retired professor of computer science. Um, but I'm also a member of the SIGGRAPH Education Committee, and I've been a longstanding member also of the Pioneers. Uh, my first conference with SIGGRAPH was back in 1986. Uh, when I, I was actually awarded uh, one of the first 15 educators' grants by SIGGRAPH to attend the conference. That's my claim to fame. My only claim to fame, I should say. No. Um, I'm also, by the way, really interested, and I'll throw this out to everybody, and this is a blatant plug. Uh, I'm also the education chair for the SIGGRAPH 2024 conference. So if you are an educator, the deadline for submission is February 21st. And as the education chair, I want lots and lots and lots of submissions. Okay, now I'll take that hat off and put in this one. As the host for this tonight, the moderator, um, I'm going to have each of our panelists give a brief, and I do mean brief, uh, presentation of who they are and, well, just who they are and where they came from, et cetera. And let's start with, Don, uh, with Dan. Take it away, Dan. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, I'm Dan Goldman. I see a lot of familiar names in the audience. Hi, Dan. Uh, and uh, I have, uh, I started my career working at Industrial Light and Magic. Um, I uh, came uh, with a computer science degree, so I started in the software department, but uh, like everyone else, I really wanted to direct, so became a technical director, um, uh, worked in, in various roles and going back and forth between production and software and R&D um, over a period of about 12 years uh, at ILM. And uh, late in that in that 12 year episode, I uh, started grad school, continued to, to do a little bit of R&D for ILM uh, for a few years, but eventually decided I needed to focus on, on completing that thesis. Um, that brought me to uh, Seattle where I am calling in from today. I know it doesn't look like it behind me, but I am in Seattle um, at the University of Washington. When I finished, I went to uh, Adobe Research uh, uh, where I worked for um, about nine years and then was recruited to uh, come to Google to work on something called Project Starline, which recently became public a couple of years ago. It's a real-time 3D telepresence system. Um, and uh, about a year and a half ago, I uh, switched into a new division in Google Labs that is focused on generative media, about which I can say uh, very little. But uh, I do need to preface this by saying um, everything else I'm about to say uh, actually, including the things I, I have said are my opinion, mine only. They have nothing to do with my employer. I have lots of opinions about this stuff, but uh, represents only my point of view. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Now, Rebecca, how about you? I'm Rebecca Perry. Um, I started out on the art side of things and uh, then discovered that computers could draw. And I used a Mac, very, very early Mac to, to get into the field. Um, I'm a longtime SIGGRAPH member and I had helped out with the history committee for quite a while. Um, I decided uh, to uh, dip my toes into academia and I went and got my PhD uh, in the history of technology. And I taught for a while at the University of Virginia and other schools. And I was teaching the history of, of computer graphics and filmmaking. I'm interested in the history of VFX too. And um, then I got interested in uh, how uh, people were interacting with computers and how they were becoming sort of um, involved with them in ways that were not just simply technical experiences. So I'm um, currently working on a research project um, with an MIT researcher, and we're studying uh, people's interactions with chat GPT and other uh, AI chat programs. And we're, we're just completed our pilot study and we're about to move on to the main study. So it's been a fascinating uh, experience to see um, to see it from a different different point of view, how people interact with things that are can be very intimate, especially during the pandemic when everybody was sort of stranded in in their little Zoom box, like we are today. Uh, you know, how did people find comfort in some of these programs? So I'm interested in that aspect. Thank you. And now Blake, how about you? Sure. Uh, my name is Blake Schurz. Uh, I'm currently working at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Um, I'm a software engineer and architect for 20 plus years. Um, the last eight years or so, I have been uh, specializing in augmented and virtual reality applications thereof, uh, non-entertainment applications specifically. Um, for a long time, I was keeping track of both the AI field and the XR field. Um, however, over the last couple of years, both have exploded to such the degree um, that I can't do both, right? I can barely keep track of one field um, with the number of hours in a day. So uh, I, I've remained an XR specialist. However, especially in the last year and a half, two years, um, a lot of that AI background has been really helpful as now we're looking at integrating the two um, and, and using AI services in the service of uh, XR environments. And last but not least, David, uh, you can introduce yourself. And David has a short, and I was told it's short, a short uh, slide presentation to get us to, to kick us off on some ideas. David, take it away. Hi, I'm David Spolstra, and um, I'm un I'm I'm uh, unemployed. Actually, I'm retired. However, I, I'm uh, getting more job offers than I ever got in my life. It's incredible, but uh, I'm trying to hold them off and um, I'm uh, playing in AI every single day. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I'm on the panel. Uh, in general, I'm a generalist. I'm fascinated about all kinds of topics, but technology is my wheelhouse and that's really where I play all the time. Um, I uh, I've served as uh, in the C suites in both uh, startups and Fortune 500s. Um, early in my career, I was a hardware software designer at Tektronix. Um, the thing that got me going at SIGGRAPH was I worked with a startup. Well, I, I was a co-founder of a startup called TrueVision, which made the Targa board. Some of you might have heard of it. It was in one of those glass display cases at the uh, last conference. And um, I ended up last year, uh, I ended my career uh, by giving back. I have I taught for 14 years part time at uh, the local college and I taught uh, digital logic design programming and microcontrollers. Um, like Bill, i am uh, been in SIGGRAPH for a long time. My first SIGGRAPH was 1982, and I have been a SIGGRAPH volunteer for 32 years now, either on the conference or on the org or right now both. I'm on GraphicsNet in the conference, and I'm also ACM treasurer right now. I'm going in my, this is my second three-year term right now. Um, and what I'm looking at right now, what really gets me motivated is 
I'm really concerned about deep fake technology um, uh, and generative AI, especially with the elections coming up. And I just read an article about some um, uh, corporate officer just lost $12 million because he had a couple of his uh, C-suite people telling him he needed to do something and he did it and it they were fake. They were generated. They were artificial. So it's it's here. It's now. And I keep pushing SIGGRAPH that we should be the leaders on helping to debunk deep fake technology and providing tools so that we can figure out what's fake and what's not. Um, uh, so, any, oh, and just as a sideline, uh, I have a bi-weekly meeting in Indianapolis where I have people from all kinds of disciplines. So uh, I've got hardware, software engineers, I've got uh, doctors, lawyers, and a bunch of people about, it runs eight to 10 people. And we meet every other week and we talk about AI and what's happening in their individual fields so we can uh, keep up with the advancements. So I'm going to show a quick, uh, a quick, I promise, Bill, uh, uh, presentation. This presentation, um, uh, Tomas Bednars and I um, have shown at SIGGRAPH Asia 22, SIGGRAPH 23, and SIGGRAPH Asia 23. And I kick it off. And what I want to get across here is just how recent this is. I mean, people... You know, AI has been researched forever, but it it is here and it is now and it is really recent. So let me share this. I call it a moment in time. And uh, basically, I, I'm a space nut. Um, I've met Neil Armstrong. I met Neil Armstrong twice, had lunch with him once. Uh, but uh, this is JFK's from JFK's uh, speech. No man can fully grasp how far and how fast we have come. And uh, so uh, the general public's first glimpse of AI, I mean, they knew stuff was going on. And pre-September 22, everybody's awareness was the promise of self-driving cars. And remember, if you can think back just two or three years, everybody was worried about the 8 million truck drivers that were going to be laid off. They were going to lose their job. And the perception was that AI would replace a whole lot of low-end jobs. Well, um, in September 22, Jason Allen uh, used Mid Journey and created a piece of art that was he entered in the Colorado State Fair um, art competition, and he won first place. And it produced a gigantic controversy. Front page news, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. It was on every news channel that night, and then it was everywhere on on every social media platform. And that was truly the general public's first exposure to the power of AI. When I talk to people about AI, I ask them, when did you first learn of it? And that is when they first learned of it. That's the picture, if you haven't seen it before. So that won uh, first place. And um, so what is the current reality of AI? Well, in just a year and a half, it's only been a year and a half. We now find AI replacing people in medical, legal, tech, creative fields, instead of all the predicted truck drivers and other low-end jobs. The explosion of news is such, I used to do a little newsletter, I just gave up. I just couldn't keep up with it anymore. It was 100% of my time. So it, it just is drowning in news. And another example is the FDA is currently approving hundreds of medical AI programs a month. My cardiologist, I was talking to him the other day, he eliminated two people from his staff uh, with an AI program that reads x-rays and MRIs. Um, and it produces quicker and more accurate results for him. So where does that leave us? Well, I ask a question to help kick things off. Is it eliminating people? Well, that's a great question. In the case of my cardiologist, from the money he saved from those two people, he was able to add another cardiologist to his practice. Uh, and now his practice can handle more people, which is a good thing because we need more cardiologists in our area. And um, another example is a local software company. They use AI to leverage their high-performing programmers. Their programmers 
started doing the work of four or five programmers. They're, they're ones that adopted the tool and, and really used it. And so they eliminated all the lower productivity ones. And so, yeah, it looked like, oh yeah, a net loss of people, but they made so much profit that they were able to launch a whole bunch of new projects and hire additional higher performing programmers. So the the way I look at it, and we were talking before this started, is it's it's like a buggy in a car. This is a tool, and it's um, um, you either get on board and learn the tool, or you're going to be like the buggy makers, and you're going to be eliminated by the car people. Or another example we use was slide rules and calculators, scientific calculators. All right, so I'm done. Thank you. Actually, as you were talking about it, David, I kept thinking about, you know, how generative AI with images, it's based upon existing images that it uses as the feedstock for producing new images. And I was thinking, could AI, if if no one had ever created works of art in a cubist vein, would generative AI be able to create a true cubist image? And I have a feeling, no. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to give this, put this right up front, and I'll just keep it short. Uh, I hate the term AI because I've been in programming since, uh, well, I was 16 years old when I started programming. We used to call these expert systems because they were all narrowly defined. They were not general intelligence. Uh, if they want to call it machine learning, I'm fine with that. But please don't call it artificial intelligence. And I know why it's called that because it's a wonderful buzz term. Anyway, let's get the thing rolling. If anybody wants to speak, please raise your hand. And I notice already that uh, Blake's got his hand raised already. So Blake, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, just uh, real quick to David's slides. Um, we have a, a saying, uh, I have a colleague who says, you know, AI isn't coming for your job. AI is not going to take your job, mm -hmm. but somebody who knows how to use AI will. Um, and as for the Cubist thing, I think what's interesting is the people that I see able to use these tools the best are the ones that have art in their background that know how to describe what it is that they're looking for. And the more skills that they have in that arena, generally the best results they get, which lends me to think that no, if you don't have a great way to describe something like Cubist, right, which is was a very new creative style. I don't think uh, I don't think it would come up with it on its own. That that is a very that's an interesting point. I I, I can appreciate that. Um, but I would think that's true for any technology that um, if you are whatever the technology is being applied to, if you're not a uh, somewhat of an expert in that field where the technology is being applied, you're going to be at a disadvantage in utilizing the technology. I, I think that's just true of the case. So let's throw out the first question. Um, I'm not going to ask you about what you think it is, generative AI, but I'd like you to talk briefly about your experiences talking about this with people who are not necessarily techies, not in the industry, as they would say, and what kind of reaction you've got from others when you start talking to them about generative AI. And I see Rebecca's got her hand up, so let's start with Rebecca. I'm going to make a remark about the previous uh, Go ahead. topic a little bit, which was um, kind of a philosophical uh, idea, I guess. Um, is is aesthetics uh, inevitably tied to human embodiment? I mean, do you have to have a human to really produce something aesthetic? You know, is it is it not the experience of being a human in a human body um, that kind of determines what aesthetics are. So that's just, I'm just throwing that out there in terms of, you know, uh, cubist works and, and, and everything like that. Um, in terms of talking about uh, this to people that are not uh, in the field or are not technically involved in this, um, one thing that I have uh, noticed, you know, I said I was doing involved in this study. I also, uh, I think I forgot to mention that I had training and development for a company called Lux Machina. And um, so I'm interested in how people learn too. And those are mostly people who are obviously in the technical field, but uh, 
one thing that's very interesting about talking to people who are not in that technical field is that they they have it, it is inevitably involving in a way that people don't expect to be involved. People will say, oh, I know it's an algorithm. You know, I know it's not real in that sense. I'm not, uh, you know, getting going to get involved, but they inevitably do end up forming some kind of an attachment to some of these uh, things, even, even in an image generation software. Um, I talked to someone who was using it to generate um, companions for himself, say. You know, and which satisfy his particular aesthetic requirements or requests, mm -hmm. you know. So just just uh, throw that out there. Okay, Dan, you got your hand raised. So we yeah, have... um, I had uh, I had dinner uh, about a month ago with um, a, a friend of mine who uh, I've been friends with her since college, and actually uh, I had the great pleasure of introducing her to the internet probably in 1992, 1993, uh, we, you know, uh, we were college classmates. Uh, I said, uh, there's this incredible thing. Uh, you know, you could find out information about anything you want. And she said, no, I can't. I said, yes, you can. And she said, can I learn about flowers? And I went to, I, it was probably even before Yahoo. It must've been like Alta Vista or some, some other search engine. And, and I looked up flowers and I found like some person who was passionate about flowers and would, handcrafted an HTML page uh, about flowers. And she was aghast. And she spent a couple of hours sitting at my, whatever it was, Macintosh Plus, um, you know, uh, pouring over all the things that you could find on the internet that, that she didn't know existed. So I had dinner with, dinner with her recently and I was telling her about generative AI, which she knew nothing about. And, uh, and I said, what kind of an image? I said, it can make any image that you can think of. And she said, no, it can't. And I said, yes, it can. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, she said, uh, you know, I want to see Ronald McDonald in a hot tub with a, a prison tray of, of food. And uh, I pulled out my phone and I brought up uh, chat GPT and I typed in those words. And sure enough, it was able to generate that first try. Um, but yes, this, this question of like being getting involved when you didn't think you could, uh, she was immediately, you know, fascinated, asked for a bunch more things. You know, what does it know? What doesn't it know? I also, um, uh, with with early, an earlier, this was with Dolly 3, which is actually quite good. With Dolly 2 last year, uh, my wife, she directs children's theater. And um, so she she was doing at the time a production of Peter Pan. And I typed into Dolly 2, like Broadway production of a punk rock Peter Pan. because that was the theme of one of her previous productions. And it produced this like amazing set that, you know, looked like it could actually be on a Broadway stage. And so she started thinking, gosh, I maybe I could use this at least to generate some ideas, so ideas for costumes and, and things like that. And so um, that's been my experience, introducing it to people who, who don't know about it, is just it immediately sparks people's creative impulse. And I think that's important to mention because a lot of practitioners are worried like, oh, this is going to like pull the creativity out of my job. But once you actually start using it, and if you try to use it for things that are, uh, you know, that, that do have a creative connection. Of course, if you're a professional, you'll immediately be frustrated because you can't actually ask it to do what you want. But if you have limited skills, let's say limited draftsmanship skills, or, or you have an idea in your head, it's actually an incredibly empowering tool to get something closer to what you might have in your head. Um, coming back to the question, I'm just to take one more minute, coming back to the question of like, you know, you're replacing jobs, not replacing jobs. To me, it reminds me the most of the situation with computer generated imagery and visual effects in Hollywood when I began in this business in the 90s. When, you know, joining ILM, many of the people who were, you know, coming into the, the computer graphics department were coming into it from the model shop, from, you know, matte painting. They were a little bit worried that if they didn't pick this stuff up, they were going to lose their jobs. And it, it is true that the, the types of jobs, the types of skills that these people had, had uh, they had to change and they had to change in order to take advantage of it. But ILM in particular recognized the value of people with an eye, people with a point of view, people with an artistic bent and, and recognized that those skills were going to transfer over mm -hmm. and, and you know, to their credit, put a bet on, on bringing those people uh, into, you know, into to digital imagery. And 
I think the same will prove true of these AI tools. It's true that right now, the ones that people are familiar with, all you have is text. It's a very crude brush. But if you look at what people are doing on the discords and on Reddit, there are other tools out there that give you more explicit control, more direct control, um, more iterative control to make corrections and, and, and to bring things closer to where your creative vision might be. And um, if, you, if, you look, if you dig deep, you'll find some, some pretty um, visionary uh, uses of this technology. I don't think it's going to replace a lot of jobs today, but as you said, the people who know how to, to, to get it, to do uh, what they have in their head, they are gonna have an advantage. You know, it's, it, you're saying that, um, as you're saying that, I'm thinking also what um, the picture that David, you had in your slides uh, that won the, won the award. And in my head, it popped. That can't be the first image that was generated by whatever system was being used. Uh, who knows how many iterations that person had to go through until they got something that was working. And I'm thinking of like in an advertising agency, the person who is the manager of an account and has the artist working for them and the artist brings up an idea and the manager says no, comes up with another idea, no, that's not it exactly yet. And there's this iterative process that goes on that personally, I don't think a, well, excuse me, I don't think the generative systems uh, are going to be there. They're tools. And, and I think, Dan, you raised that word, tool. That's exactly what they are. I mean, I mean, if you go back into the art field, the, uh, to be an artist who could paint a photograph, paint a photographically real image of somebody was considered to be the height of expertise. And then the camera came along. And you didn't need to be an artist creating something that was photographically real. So that freed the artist to explore other ways of expression. And maybe this is a tool will free up artists uh, and I'm thinking again, my area is, is the arts and technology free up the artist to explore new ways to produce images. We don't know yet. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, I see David's got his hand raised. So David, you want to say something? Yeah, real quick along that line. Um, uh, two things you, you asked originally about, uh, general public and their, their misunderstandings. Well, I talk to the general public all the time about AI. My my wife hates going to parties with me because that's all I talk about nowadays. But um, uh, what I hear is it's magical and no one understands how it works. It just makes a, a identical copy of everything it sees and does a sophisticated cut and paste. It's going to replace everyone or it's all hype. And then I wanted to to. Uh, give one example we were talking about exposing people well my wife is an artist and we build her a giant art studio and um she has over a group of women um every sunday and they sit in a big circle and they put something in the middle and they paint it or whatever they're doing at that moment and it takes you know over weeks they get their paintings and everything mm -hmm. one day they were doing something and I decided that I would whip out some AI. So I got on mid journey, I forget. And so five minutes later, I'm showing my done pictures and they're all like, yeah, but they actually listened. And the interesting thing is they adapted it. So now when they want to paint something, they'll use an AI uh, uh, art program, AI art program to pre-visualize and kind of talk to it, uh, you know, type in what they want to get it somewhat like they want, and then they'll paint it with their medium. So I found that interesting. So are you saying that uh, AI says these, these systems are, are more like administrative assistants, bringing new ideas to the table, doing the footwork and grabbing all the ideas together, but there has to be a human at some point who makes the final decision of what to accept image wise or not? Oh, I think you're always going to have that, I mean, for the foreseeable future, because it's too hard to tell it exactly what you want, and you're going to have to tweak it. I mean, at some point, you probably can't even tell it enough to get exactly what you want, and you might drop into Photoshop or something and tweak it from there. Blake, you're being very quiet. You want to kick in? 
Sure. So um, in my free time, I run around a, a, a number of art circles. I have a friend who's a professional artist and I go to art events. I'm not good, um, but that's not the point. I go and have fun and, and expand my mind and do other things. Um, and so a lot of the general public that I, I interact with has very strong opinions, right? And and and, and they're polar opposites of you know this is nothing but a intellectual property infringement machine. Um, to oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever, and and now I'm I'm an artist, and and the truth is in the middle there somewhere. And so that's mm-hmm. you know one one of the things that I I remind people is as you use these tools, it's really a lot less of being an artist and being somebody who is commissioning an artist. You are providing a description, paying a very small amount of money, and then you are getting back a piece of art that resembles that, you know, what you what you have described. Um, my personal anecdote with this is that my father is Santa Claus. Um, full beard, all, the whole nine, does tons of charity work. Um, and he had in mind a children's book. And he would try to describe to the artists what he wanted to illustrate his children's book. And he was unable to do so. And I even took a stab at it based on his descriptions. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, there's so much here that's missing from these descriptions. I need to know about the lighting and I need to know about all of these things. And and so there's this huge hurdle where he couldn't express what he wanted. Um, And then we spent an afternoon with Midjourney and that pretty much took care of that. Um, where as, as a communication tool between, and much like you were saying, Bill, between a non-artist and an artist, um, there is a lot of use. Um, and also personally, I have used it as, to generate reference material for, um, I, I did a, a unity scene where I just wanted to work on my, my aesthetics of, of, um, game dev. And so I used it as reference material to come up with some some look dev stuff of what I wanted to create. You know, you, what you were talking about, um, somebody working with artists who are basically lower order in the pecking. Um, the school that I actually retired from had a very, very good, uh, in the arts department, a very good program in illustration, quite well known, in fact. And... It reminds me of what students or illustrators do is that they get source material and they get and they're on their board where they're working on an illustration, they have photos and clippings and everything else. And they're copying an element from this photo into their illustration, a copy of an element to this one and a copy here. And then they produce this amalgam, taking elements from all the source material that they started with. And gee, that sounds like what these systems are doing right now, except they're doing it in a automatic fashion. That's what it sounds like. Anyway, keep, I'm going to move on. And next question I want to raise with you guys is, if we can anthropomorphize these systems a little bit, that's a wee bit, would you consider these systems to be the uh, at the stage of the uh, the whining infant in the stroller, the toddler crawling, the toddler is beginning to walk across the floor, the preteen starting to be a pain in the butt. The teenager thinking that the teenager is 34 and only 14. The young adult, the middle age, or the old fart like me. I mean, where where would you, you know, in, in the sense of the evolution of these systems, where are they right now? You know, it's what what is the level of maturity of them? That's what I'm asking for. And I see Blake's got his hand raised right away. So go for it. So I, I think my my best analogy here is that we, we are do- dealing with a savant child, right? So that we have a 10-year-old who is just fantastic and is just mind-blowing, right? And now they're in college. And they do not fit in. And nobody knows what to do with this 10-year-old who's hanging out with these 20-year-olds. We're talking and, about Sheldon here? And and so, right. Like, I think that over time, this is all going to mature more and it's going to, you know, be useful for even more things. But there is this, like, brilliant, awkward stage that we are, I, I think we are very strongly in right now. Mm. Dan, you, you were next up with the hand. 
Yeah, I think I think you brought up a good point, which is that like th there's a very big gap between the skills of these models and their expertise. Those are two different things, right? And so they're incredibly skilled, but they have no competency, right? Um, I think that's that's how I think of it. The other way that I describe it to people who are new to this, who are trying to get something new out of it, is think of it as like the best intern you've ever had, right? They 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 come out of the best school. They have all the right education, all of the right credentials. They got straight A's. They aced every test, and then they come into the real world and they actually have to do a job, and they're completely unprepared because they never had to do things that you have to do in a real job, like talk to people and find out the stakeholders' interest and all these things. You know, so like um, that's that's how I think about it. When I'm asking a question, I'm like, okay, I got to frame this in the right way. Give the give the system all the context they need to make use of the the raw materials that that they may have learned in in high school and college. Um, and back to the apprentice model, I, I was mentally thinking about what they need is a good manager to yeah. shepherd them through the process. Yeah, that's a, and that's a good way to think about um, about the user's role in interacting with these systems today. Um, and I think that also rings true with some of the, the studies. I think they've been done more on the language side than on the image side, though I have a hunch that this is also true in, in the image side. There's There's been some good evidence that um, when you when you try to use AI to complete a task, um, most of these language models today, they will raise the average performance level, whether you measure it in speed or quality uh, of you know the entire cohort. But it makes a much bigger difference for the people in the middle and the low end of the cohort to begin with in terms of their skills. It's going to up level the people, which is why it was interesting that uh, David, you said that like they they this uh, business laid off their lower skilled workers because actually those are the people who get the biggest boost from from using AI co-pilots and AI assistants. Um, the people who are already good at this they end up spinning their wheels because they actually already know how to get the right answer. They already you know have their own mental model of how to do it. And it's actually maybe just slowing them down. Um, and so again, if you think about like a really skilled intern, actually the people who can get the most out of it are the people who can communicate well. They can they can explain, oh, here's what I want, but I, I don't actually know how to do it. Can you go out and figure it out? And you know, uh, the, the, the highly skilled but incompetent intern can, can probably make something out of it. Thank you. Now I got Rebecca, your hand was up next. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, sort of introduce the idea that these things you know, they're based on a training set, training database. And those things are not neutral, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a bit of a, an issue. I, I, uh, I read recently that it was in July of last year, um, OpenAI bought the access to the entire Associated Press database, say, to train their models on. Okay, so that's fine. You know, Associated Press, reputable organization, you know, they strive for you know, neutrality and accuracy and all that kind of good journalistic stuff. But, you know, it could easily be, you know, not that way. And prejudices and, you know, um, homophobic, raci racist, all these kinds of ideas mm -hmm. also creep into these databases, right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, the, the end user isn't necessarily always aware of, you know, how this model was trained. So, you know, I think humans will have to be very good at kind of spotting those things. And um, or, or we can have other you know, systems to do that for us. Possibly. <laughs> but I agree, it's infancy stage. Yeah, so, you, so you're thinking infancy. Uh, Dan, Blake, uh, what, do you, what do you guys think? Uh, infants, toddlers, preteen, teen, where, where is it? I think I agree with the comment that it's, it's like... Uh, uh, a ten-year-old who thinks they're thinks they're thirty or something like that. Infants, like, yeah. As again, maturity. Um, yeah, that's. I, I think it's that that savant. But yes, I think it's still a young child. Um, yeah. To Rebecca's point, actually, uh, which I think is extremely important, right? The idea that there's all of these biases that are built into this latent space. Um, it does also make me wonder. Um, are we now quantifying our biases in ways that have always been qualitative in the past? And can we actually use that as a mechanism to raise a mirror to ourselves, to uh, analyze some of these biases mm -hmm. as we dig into that latent space? That's a wonderful metaphysical concept. I'm not quite sure who a lot of people is going to fly. I'm sorry. Um, 
you know, I'm, and when you're talking about like, it's, it's, it's the learning set that you start with. And as a, somebody who's been programming since he was a teen, uh, the, the phrase popped into my mind, garbage in, garbage out. And that that's a model for any anybody working with databases or programming. You got bad you got bad data in the beginning. You're going to get a bad result. And I know in the early stages of of this, I tried out not only Midjourney but other ones. And Midjourney did a fairly good job. And I tried some of these other systems for images, and I got garbage. I mean, the images that look like Bleh! And why? And I said, well, it's because the training set. And it's not just images, because the images have to be keyworded. They have to be described somehow so that the, the generative systems know, oh, this is an image to use because in this image, there is a picture of a cat. So if I want to have a cat dancing the Fandango, this is an image I might want to use. And David's got his hand up. Yeah, I was just going to tag on what Dan said about the low end programmer. So in this uh, programmers, in this case, uh, so you've probably seen some of these guys, they want to learn just like .NET and do that for the rest of their life and they never learn anything else. So these guys, they tried to get them to learn, you know, how to uh, to use this and learn some new things and they didn't. So that's, that's what happened. So I, it's just like I told my students forever. It's a tool. This is the hot tool. You've got to learn it. You've got to exploit it. And that will put you ahead of a bunch of people that are resistant to change or learning new things. Yeah. All right. Uh, Rebecca, you want to make a another comment? You get your hand yeah, just, uh, just and just another uh, response to the, to what was just said that. Um, you know, I, and maybe, uh, Bill, you could have shed some light on this, but my understanding is that large language models are essentially, the way they're used, they're used at their prediction systems. And there's a whole bunch of information, and you put down a word and in the text version, you put down a word, and it predicts the next most likely word that will follow. Yeah, so therefore, it kind of reinforces conformity rather than yep. innovation, right? Yep. My understanding is it's not like, the, it's not like, what is the next word given the last word you had, but rather what is the next word given the last million words that you did? Right, right. What would be the next but word? But I mean, essentially, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's predictive. It's not going to come up with, um, it's not going to be able to wait. If you asked, uh, if you asked a, a, a chat, AI chat system, for example, tell me all the solutions for world hunger and which one's the best. It's not going to be able to weigh those at all. You know, there's no, no sense of value or weighting of importance. It's a weighting of likelihood. It, of a certain, it will do. Of it, certain... it, may, it may do a fairly good job of summarizing the opinions that exist in the learning set that it's been trained with, but that's about it. Uh, I was thinking, as a programmer, my area is computer science. How they've been using the generative systems to produce programs. You know, the whole idea that eventually we're going to have computer programs that write the programs. We won't need programs anymore. And most of the programs that were being generated uh, were trash worthy in the garbage can. Mistakes all over the place. Uh, the kind of dumb mistakes that even freshman programmers get rid of really quick. Well, these systems are doing it. Uh, also, they were doing bad programming practices, which we always try to drum out of the of the the students. Uh, which uh, brings me to, to another question, which is, do you think that the companies that have been working with these systems, uh, developing them, do you think they should have waited a while before they did a general release to the public? I mean, are they still too much in their evolution? to have released them now, that the, the companies should have waited a little bit. If you go to the genie bottling plant <laughs> and try to put all the genies back in the bottle, I mean, that's the, that's the problem right there. Yeah. Once the idea is out there and once someone develops it, someone's going to release it. Someone. Yeah. David. Yeah, I totally agree with that. The, the profit motive is too strong and also... Um, if, you know, like there was some resistance in the U.S., like let's make them stop for six months or something, but other countries are going to continue to do it. And so, 
it's yeah it's a genie in the bottle thing it's it's out it's just gonna keep going yeah well i'm gonna call on blake next but before i do that i just want to tell people who are attending this tonight that uh you can pop questions into the chat and ed's go ed's keeping track of the chat and um at some point we'll start asking questions of people uh but for now we're just going to some questions that we that uh the pioneers committee had questions that we thought about for a while to try and get some ideas of what to ask and blake you know you got your hand raised now yeah the the question of was it too early um i personally and and we are definitely getting very much into personal opinion territory right as opposed to professional opinion territory i am very glad um that these things started showing up when they were kind of crappy because we can pick them out mid journey right now has a feel there's a a certain mid journeyness to it right that i can pick out and so i think about some of the things of like the deep fakes which are very troubling uh the mm -hmm. kinds of things that happened to taylor swift if these things had been released only when they were excellent um you know, we think that there there's controversy now, like there would have been tortures and pitchforks if it was, mm. you know, really indistinguishable. With respect to the general public, what do you think is the is the most common misperception, misunderstanding they have about what generative AI can or cannot do? I I think it it is you know, kind of to some of our earlier conversation, the idea that on one hand, people think that it's really creating or they are creating art as opposed to commissioning it, right? Um, and the other thing is that it, it you know, the idea that all it could ever be is a copyright infringement machine, right? You can do interesting things with it that are fairly unique and that are inspirational that... Um, provide a mechanism to have art in places where really people would not go to the time, energy, or expense to, to hire an artist or do the art themselves. So, um, yeah, it's, it, you know, it's kind of a mix. Now, hearing the word art being bopped around, and a long time ago, I learned that the image itself is not art. It is, by definition, a work of art, that art is the process the artist goes through to produce the final result. Um, and therefore, and, and, and the artist is a human artist, at least today. I don't think we have computer systems that can replicate the creative artistic process that a human goes through. Um, I'm, that's an opinion. That's an opinion. I label it so that, I think that what these are producing are images, but I would not call them works of art. And that's just an opinion. Any feedback on that? Anybody want to stab me in the back with that one? Rebecca, what do you got your hand up for? Go. I just wanted to respond to that because I think that's very interesting. So say we had a dolly generated image and we had a machine vision viewer, you know, interpreting that image and describing it. You know, is there any art possible in that interaction if you take the human completely out of the equation i would say you know? no i would say no. yeah yeah Dan. i would agree yeah i mean uh i think people bring up uh oftentimes the analogy of of uh you know a photograph of the camera which um i learned actually fairly recently that when photography began photographs were not copyrightable and i think a lot of the argument for why was uh, around the same thing like oh it's just it's just literally making a copy of the real world it can't be art because it's 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 not doing anything creative uh -huh. um and over time there was a recognition that ah well actually the person who's holding the camera the person who's developing the film the person who's you know uh, uh telling people where to stand they actually have some creative agency here uh -huh. and uh so that that means that the the output of this long process, which may involve some technical pieces that are nothing but chemistry uh, and, and optics, actually, you know, can be considered copyrightable. That doesn't get to your question of, is it art? Um, no, I, that's a good um, observation. And so I'll come back to you with a, a counter question, is that would you then say that the person who is using, say, Midjourney, 
um, is the artist that mid journey is not the artist. Mid journey is the tool like the camera is for the photographer and that the person using mid journey is the artist. If that is true, then how would you describe the artistic process that that artist is going through? What is this artistic process? In that scenario, I would make a distinction between the person who just logged on to Midjourney and said, uh, imagine a crocodile wearing a crown, okay? That's not art any more than if I grab a paintbrush and, and you know, throw it at, uh, at the wall. Uh, uh, okay, yes, I've made an image, I've made a painting. Is it art? Okay, uh, yeah, I'm gonna need a, a gallery owner to weigh in on that. But chances are, uh, you, you give a paintbrush and a, and a blank canvas to 100 people who have never done it before, uh, you're not going to call that it. However, if you actually talk to people who are active in the journey, who are, who are active uh, working with Stable Diffusion, and there's a, an ecosystem called Comfy UI that allows you to do pretty complex workflows uh, with, with Stable Diffusion and other related open source models, um, they're thinking deeply about what they want to control and how they want to control it. And what is the pose and what is the, uh, you know, does it look like this person? Does it look like this style? Um, they're, they're making a lot of creative choices. Uh, and, you know, I'm not gonna say that is definitely art because I think again, art is in the eye of the beholder, but it definitely raises the bar to say, you know what? That person is making a lot of creative choices that should be considered in the question of, uh, you know, do I do I consider this art? Um, With respect to cameras, is pretty akin to a an experienced photographer, from yes. a, as an artist who truly understands. Oh, let's go back to the days of film for art for cameras. They understand film exposure, uh, light settings, technical issues. But, but hey, you know, oil painting there are technical issues. Watercolor there are technical issues. And, um, and there's a, and you know, the history of art is is rife with people exploring new technologies. Anybody here saw the film "The Girl with the Pearl Earring"? Uh, because in that one is very clear. Vermeer, he made his own paints. They didn't have paints in a tube. He had to make his own paint, and that was a technical. I was a skill considered that if you were a good artist, you knew how to do your paints well. How many artists today make their own paints? Because this. This is SIGGRAPH, so we're talking about image, et cetera. Um, what needs to happen with the technology and what has to happen with the people who use it such that the use of this, this new technology can be labeled an artistic process? Blake, you get your hand raised. I will say controversial things and people can come at me. I think picking up a paintbrush and throwing it at a wall is completely valid art. I think the difficulty of creating art has nothing to do with the value of that art. I also think that as we look at these things, art is art so long as there is an audience who deems it so. And that audience can include the artist. So you can go and you can make something, you can throw your paintbrush against the wall, and you can call that art, and if you feel like that's art, then it is art. Yeah, you could drip paint all over a canvas. A la and, Jackson Pollock. Right, I was going to say. And and Pollock did it beautifully and in interesting ways. But just because some ways are more difficult than another, it really comes down to audience and how it is perceived. And that audience also includes the artist. Mm -hmm. David? Totally agree with Blake. Um, art is in the mind eye of the of beholder. The eye of the beholder, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm I go to the Indianapolis Art Museum and there are pieces I love that other people hate and there's pieces I hate that other people love. And so uh just like Blake said, if somebody throws something against the wall, if there's a bunch of people that go, ah, and they're willing to buy it, well, it's art, I guess. So it's in the mind of the beholder. Is it possible with the systems today to use them in a way that we could label it? an artistic process or part of an artistic process? If not, what has to happen so we could label it as an artistic process utilizing generative AI systems? Like I've said from the beginning, I believe it's a tool. It's just another tool for the artist in my mind. Um, sure, there are people that can sit there and type a good prompt and make a great image, but um, you know there are 
just as many other people that will use that image and then they will manipulate it from there with other tools like Photoshop to make something that's closer to what they want. So to me, it it's a tool. And so therefore, it's a tool being used in a artistic process. What, you don't think that art students should be never never allowed to touch a computer in their four years for their bachelor's degree? Actually, at IUPUI, Indianapolis University, Purdue University, I know the head of the Heron Art School, and they are teaching the students to use um, generative AI in the in their process. Very interesting. Because, I mean, years ago, I remember being told that at, at Savannah College Art and Design SCAD, first-year students were not allowed to use a computer. They had to create their animations by hand in a very traditional fashion so they could truly embrace what it means to produce animations. I don't think you necessarily do. Um, just like um, uh, engineering, you don't learn all the fundamentals all the way up to where we are today because there isn't enough time to teach you that. So they'll teach you some fundamentals that you definitely need. And then they'll teach you a little bit to give you some flavor, but then they'll jump you up with the current tools to get you so that then you can move forward from there. Believe it or not, we're actually an hour in already. Um, are, are we getting questions, by the way, in the chat? Yeah, we are getting some questions. One of the questions I'd like to have the panelists address came from my old office mate, Scott Meese at ILM. Um, he was actually curious where the panel sees generative AI going next, as in text to movie, image to movie is an obvious one, but do you see near-term advancements in fields like rigging animation, modeling, surfacing, et cetera. Rebecca, you're first. I think that the, all the, everything to do with uh, moving into 3D is where it's going next, obviously. Um, Isn't know, it kind image... of already? I mean, they're having it where they can take an actor and make the actor look like they're much, much, much older, much younger. I'm thinking uh, Harrison Ford in the latest Indiana yeah. Jones, where they made him look a but lot he, younger. Yeah, but he was not generated by uh, generative AI. You know, I'm just saying there was a lot of uh, actual human 3D modeling involved and, you know, scanning and things. Um, and I think that perfecting that, yeah, and it was done by veteran modelers. Um, exactly. So, but that that area is where they're going to try to make it move next. Um, I just want to say one other thing about the idea of the artistry. Uh, you know, you, you know, in SIGGRAPH, whenever something cool comes out, and you see like a new technique for flowing water. Every film you see the following year has that. That's you flowing. say, oh, there's that waterfall or there's that pool, you know. And I think that in, right now we're at that stage with generative AI where people will start to do, you know, that our eyes will become trained. And we'll say, oh, that's a generative AI effect, you know, or conception or something. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of, it's hard to tell, but I think yeah. that people with sophisticated, you know, views on this will will end up being able to to tell that but you know the question is you know eventually those become tools that invisibly blend in with the rest of the toolbox and they don't stand out anymore it, it sounds like you're describing this as kind of like the puppy love phase for the technology and that eventually that's going to fade away and and you'll see what's really left or the novelty phase yes. maybe yeah novelty yeah Dan, you got your uh, your hand raised. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, to answer the question, yes, all of those traditional 3D disciplines are going to be impacted. There's no question in my mind. Um, hopefully in good ways, hopefully in ways that take more of the TDM out and and uh, introduce more of the creativity in. I guess I'm, I'm, you know, maybe too much of an optimist on that on that side of things. But I think there's a, um, there's a company that I've seen uh, just demos. I don't know if they're, you know, how real it is, but there's a company called move.ai. Um, that is doing some video-based motion capture that, um, you know, probably it, it doesn't really compete, I think, with like a, a optical motion capture uh, in, a, in a studio. But hey, if you're on a budget, you're, you've just got a set and you got to capture something, it looks pretty good. It's going to need some cleanup like everything else, but um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to save you some time. So uh, that's the name of the game, right, for, for visual effects and animation. It's, same you know, I can do the same thing uh, in, in, you know, fewer days, fewer hours. Uh, that's the way it's ready to do it. When I think about this, I'm reminding, I guess I'm, I'm the old fart who's been around long enough in, in animation. And I think of when motion capture became the thing, 
It's going to save the world. Can anybody remember the film Final Fantasy? Once that novelty phase wore off, people really started exploring how could you use the technology well. And that's when beneficial changes to the technology, beneficial evolution of it started. Going to the future, and it's funny because I remember the end credits of Ratatouille in there that they said, you know, like no motion capture was used, right? That they made a big deal the other way. Um, no, I think, you know, as as the XR guy, right, we we're talking about virtual reality and where are we going faster, right, is is always the thing in that, you know, you'll have the ability to have a virtual world where you can hold up a picture frame and view through a lens and view creative things. I already have a, an art project where I can take a snapshot and it uploads it to Stable Diffusion XL with ControlNet with a prompt. And then it comes back of this, you know, like lush alien garden right? Depending on what you take a picture of and something mundane, and then it comes up with this picture, right? I think the creativity tools are going to be amazing. You know, the hand tracking we have today, which are also powered by, you know, similar techniques. Um, but, you know, as a kid, you know, we're going, oh, the airplane's going to go like this, right? And now that's the animation tool, right? Where you're taking that action, figuring out where the hand is, and then thinking, what is a realistic animation pipeline that could come from that mm -hmm. and you know so i think and it's going to get just more real time more feedback faster iterations um and it'll yeah animation rigging please um and then some of these other uh you know real-time interactive games and stuff i think it's going to be fantastic automatic rigging is not a newbie right. that's been been working on for quite some time they have the programs that can analyze uh, a given model and can propose generally a fairly good rig may not suit all purposes but for the general case it works any more questions ed we got in the pipeline yes actually what i would like to do is um um Bautik joshi would you like to ask uh, uh, the panelists a question or yes there you go thank you so much for the discussion it's really 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 interesting i guess something that's been on my mind is really sort of where is this tooling going right because we we center a lot around prompts and prompts are sort of really awkward interfaces if you like i mean they're not like the the, the idea of being able to describe things with words is very sort of difficult um you know there's the joke going around that like you know ai won't replace artists because you know you require a client it's going to require someone to describe exactly what they want right so uh, do we see a future for all of this technology where we sort of steer away from prompts? Um, and like, you know, what is that going to look like? Okay, Dan, and then Blake. Yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm the one here saying, yes, yes, that is going to happen. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. I mean, I uh, without getting too much into detail on the kinds of things that I'm working on, text is very impoverished relative to a lot of things that we, we know how to do. I think if you look at, at what, um, even the academic literature, I think, I think, Academics working in this space recognize that more control is the name of the game. Um, my my colleague Manisha Gawala from Stanford published a paper called Control Net about a year ago now. Uh, it seems like a century, uh, showing that you could um, you know provide depth maps uh, as input. You can provide um, you know edges as input. You can provide uh, pose skeletons as input and generate images that um, that conform to those. Um, uh, I, I had have my own paper. Uh, that was uh, that's on archive now called Readout Guidance, uh, where we showed that actually you don't need to have millions of images to train these. Um, you can we, we showed in one case you can train these kinds of control systems using as few as a hundred uh, pairs of control and, and output image. Um, and so we're uh, we're working on figuring out how do we sort of incorporate that into more artist in the loop controls and say I like that one, I don't like that one. You you can ask a system like generate a hundred things. And then pick the ones you like and then say, okay, I want more of these. I want fewer of these. Um, there's all kinds of ways that we can uh, address the sort of selection and control problem. And we're throwing, you know, the kitchen sink at it because I think we don't yet know, like, what's going to be easiest to use, what's going to work the best from a technical standpoint. Um, what you're saying is that right now, people don't know how to use it to its best advantage yet, that we're still playing with it. And my particular point of view is in that is that the best the best learnings are when you have um, artists working side by side with technologists and uh, discovering these together 
I, I think back to, you know, my time at ILM in the early days of, of, you know, computer graphics, that was exactly the environment that we had. We like had a problem to solve. We had a vision. We had, you know, the director says he wants dinosaurs. Um, how do we do that? Artist has some idea. Technologist has some idea. They come together and they and they figure out a, a solution jointly. So uh, it's actually, you know, sort of the inspiration for the, the work that I'm doing right now to try to bring together these disciplines and 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 play and experiment um, and learn from each other. Yeah, Blake, you had your hand raised. Yeah, actually, Dan just. Um... Stole your the word I was going to be using, which is play. I think that prompts are fine, you know, but as we look at uh, the way user interfaces have changed, right? Punch cards, which is before my time. Um, but then keyboards was, you know, uh, pre-mouse, that was my time. And keyboards are great. They're extremely accurate. That's why they're still around. But they're, they're also kind of a challenge. Um, and then mice. And, and then touchpads and, and, you know, styluses kind of intermingled a couple of different iterations throughout that. But one of the things I love about XR is that it knows so much about the operator. And we are designing systems, building systems that are paying attention to, to the operator and what their physiological state is. In some cases, we're even getting glimpses into their mental state and that it, instead of prompts that we are dealing with systems that are more intuitive and that they are playful and that they are interactive. And so it's it's a much more creative symbiotic thing where it's like when you're a kid, you had a friend and maybe you're working on something together. And then, you know, but in this case, you know, the the other kid never gets tired of it, never gets bored of it and and is able to be that creative sounding board and complement for as long as you need to um, to be able to keep going on this this explorative generative journey. I just want to remind everybody for all practical purposes, it's a year and a half old. Of course, the interfaces are going to change and adapt it just like every other interface. When I uh, answer emails and do documents, I talk now. I don't type hardly anything. I just go in and correct a few things. but. Basically, I dictate. So the interfaces will change to be more practical for what you're trying to do. And as my good friend Bonnie Mitchell points out, you know, we've now we're now talking. Uh, uh, Musk is talking about brainwave interfaces. So who knows what we're going to have in the future? From a computer science side, um, we're talking about what they call human factors. It's that a technology that really works well is the one that the human does not necessarily adapt to the technology. The technology adapts to the human and changes so that the human can use it in a very natural fashion. We're still typing, right? And keyboards haven't actually adapted to us all that much since they started. I just want to say something about the human uh, in the in the loop here. Um, you know, there's there's this whole interesting area of generative AI that's being go, going by the name Grief Tech. I don't know if you've heard of that, where there's the, the attempt to sort of preserve a person who has passed or even before they're before they're gone, scan them, capture their words, and then create something interactive that mm -hmm. you can sort of uh, replicate the experience of having a conversation with someone. And I will just want to wonder if anyone here thinks that there are dangers in that is that more of a will that be a beneficial thing as that develops further and it probably will develop further or is that something that we should sort of put the guardrails on and say mm, some things shouldn't be done just wondering what people think about that well are we talking about something that's kind of like twilight zone in the sense of you know so far in the future why are we worrying about it right now it's not in the future it's happening now <laughs> There's lots of programs that do that right now, and people get extremely mo emotional and motivated to engage with these things. You know, it's like you can preserve a certain slice of time and revisit that slice of time using very sophisticated uh, models and um, voice and replicating all kinds of things. And generative AI is really uh, assisting that process and moving it forward. So I just I just was curious if people think that's a thing. I mean, we're talking mostly about, I guess, film and um, and games and things. But um, there's this other whole dimension to 
where AI is possibly being used and that's, you know, assisting human living in some way or assisting human coping yeah. with. Yeah. Well, you, you talk about uh, in the medical field, uh, but then again, I think the, the use of generative AI in the medical field is really an extension of say expert systems, which have been around for quite some time. Uh, and they're statistical though. They, they say, you know, what well, we had, if you have these symptoms for this period of time, this, this severity, blah, 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 this is the, uh, there's a 99% possible pro probability that it's this diagnosis. There's a 92% probability it's this diagnosis, et cetera. They've been around for as I say that, I'm in a very privileged point in my life right now, right? My children are healthy. Uh, my parents are healthy. Um, I have lost my brother, which is unfortunate, and I mourn his loss years ago. But I don't feel a digital memorial for him would be in best interest. However, when I think about other phases of life, right, when you have a child who didn't get to know their parent, or when you have an adult who is a stage of their life where their memory isn't good, or their maybe dementia has been onset, and they are trying to reach out for the child that they think is still alive, right? And trying to communicate with them. And then every time they find out that their child is unavailable, they have to go through the mourning process again, right? that that is a scenario where I can see a very moral use of that kind of technology. Um, so yes, not for me at this point in my life, but um, I, I can't just write it off and say no. Ed, what, what are the questions do we have? Any others? Um, I'd like to, I'd like to, if I can open the floor to uh, Dennis Blakey, another SIGGRAPH pioneer who could have been potentially a panelist tonight. So Dennis, I'm going to allow you to talk. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having the panel. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a privilege to uh, be able to speak just a couple of minutes. I know I'll keep it short. Um, a lot of great points. My area, I started back in 86, uh, CalArts, first system. Uh, very fortunate to have a guy from Wavefront come spend a couple hours with me showing the ropes when everyone was away and it was being unboxed and I became the go-to guy. Just wanted to throw out there, maybe through ACM and our learning center, we could have uh, volunteers, students love to have a first job, uh, help our members with what is AI about. Um, don't miss the boat because I've seen people, as we've all seen, um, when computers came in, when 3D came in over hand-drawn, people losing jobs or being discouraged, they take a job somewhere else. Help our members actually embrace this because they are tools. They are tools. And in my use, um, it's in focus in real-time video and with stable diffusion, comfy UI, animated diff. Yes, there's possibilities, even some things I've been working on that, okay, well, instead of modeling and animating it, uh, texturing, we can take some finished photography. We can use animated diff to make some movements around it, but it's in an infancy. So it is not something to feel like... Um, uh, this is all figured out. We all know this. Uh, working with alpha, working with higher resolution, guiding it, controlling it. My, we all know uh, working on films, film uh, directors, visual effects supervisors, very detail oriented. That's exceedingly difficult to tell an AI derived image or video exactly what I want to change and do it for more than 25 frames. Have it go longer, have it go higher res. So there's a, lots of great places for the research. I uh, just wanted to mention... Um, when um, Rebecca said about spotting, um, AI use in spotting what we're doing in this world, benefiting planet Earth, uh, recent paper in Nature where we've got 75% of overfishing has been undetected, but using AI to analyze satellite imagery, we can see where there's a lot going on in protected areas where it shouldn't be. That's a great use of AI, I think, of anything. So this is in, in my focus and in, in where I am in life right now is we're going to use AI in helping planet Earth, our oceans, and our land, and be healthy stewardship. 
this is where I like to feel good in using some of these tools because they are they are tools. And it is very much as I found is what it's uh, trained on. Uh, if you train it on copywritten material, we have a problem. But if you want to train it on something of your own design within a company, it's a very useful tool. It's not the copyright issue. We certainly would find that at Disney. We would all look at uh, uh, images to, you know, as we know, do our due diligence and create our work, but we wouldn't copy it. Uh, but we would um, work with our digital development artists within the company to make something. So AI can be very useful. I think uh, along with prompt engineering, people who can um, train AI, know how to train it on very specific data sets to get it to run faster is a great area to learn. Embeddings, LoRa's, the control of AI, the guidance of it, all sorts of research on a to the day basis. And I think what's made the explosion of these from all of us that started when the boxes were $50,000 for an SGI or Wavefront, like when I started, is that this is open source, like with stable diffusion. It's available to so many people all around the world. And so there is an explosion of work, uh, but it is still very much uh, in an infancy. And I'll just mention with the keyboard and the um, mouse input for years have been, where are we going to get to two-handed? two-handed input where we're trying to manipulate and build 3D with a thumb and a finger, but it's because what we're trained people on to hire into companies that know those tools. So sure, there are those C-graph fun things and niche areas where we make tools that do um, interaction a different way, but the whole bulk of artists out there are not trained in those tools. And I recall one, if anybody remembers, Nolan Bushnell had a device you could wear on your finger and you could actually control flying uh, free form around an orchard with just your mind and all it was was a little lie detector like circuit so you kind of could lean it left or right i remember doing that for like an hour with my mind i got to where just very zen like i could control flying and then a funny thing i remember getting in the car and like there's that weird brain switch of oh no no i'm controlling the car so sometimes careful what we wish for but uh, i do think in the area of 3d i'm starting to see how the pipelines themselves can in some places you jump right to finished imagery with AI. And what's really cool that I don't hear a lot about, but I see it in my eyes is AI borrows from all these images. So when it creates the final image, it's not necessarily photorealistic. It can be if it's trained, but it can also be non-photorealistic. It's like a renderer that has a different feeling because it's borrowing all this different kinds of lighting. And I think that's what's really cool about it. Anyway, I've used up my time. Thank you very much for tonight. I'm really enjoying this. Thank you. All right, great. Um, Dan, before we go, um, could you let everybody know how they can be put on your uh, mailing list for uh, your your daily updates on AI? It's dandygoldman.substack.com. Um, and uh, I feel like this was like a paid promotion. It's not. Uh, we didn't plan this in advance. Um, it's a daily newsletter, week daily newsletter. I don't do it on the weekends and I do take vacations. Um, it's not really, uh, I don't put much of my own commentary. It's just a list of links to things that I've seen in the last 24 hours that I think are interesting in specifically in generative media. So I don't do a whole lot about language unless it relates to journalism or something like that. Um, but it includes both news articles and research papers and GitHub links and just sort of anything that I think might be interesting to, um, to people that, that want to follow this and, and see um, what the latest is. And it, it will, Substack will ask you how much you want to pay. You do not have to pay anything. Just say, click out of that and it, it'll let you subscribe for free. I don't charge anything. I just want to remember people out there that this, that think about it. At one point, handwriting was a new technology. The printing press was a new technology. The bicycle was a new technology. We don't think about that, but it was. Actually, speech was an evolution in human advancement. Now, let's go for final comments because we've got about three minutes left. So you're going to keep your comments really, really short. And I'm going to start with Rebecca. Wow. Just summing this up. I mean, there's just so many different applications. It's hard to, you know, sort of say what this is all about. But I just I just think that it's important to keep the human in the center of, of thinking about when harms, you know, any possible harms, because we are very susceptible to falling in love with technologies. And they can't really love us back. <laughs> Just want to say that. Okay, Dan. 
Yeah, I think I think that's great. It's it's been really interesting to have this conversation. I was in a lot of discussions maybe a year ago when I think there was a lot more negativity uh, and and fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So I'm excited that there's more positivity. But I think we should also, as Rebecca pointed out, uh, not ignore some of the you know concerns and dangers. We didn't really spend much time talking about about deep fakes. Um, I, I think, and this is very once again definitely just me talking. I think um, you know, impersonating another person without their consent, whether it's you know for you know internet porn or just you know anything, I think that is something that that culturally we need to come to grasp uh, in a different way. I suspect there may be legal you know action. I think it's one one of the few things that Republicans and Democrats may actually be able to agree on. So I expect to see something coming down the pike legally for that, but. Um, uh, I think that is that is an area where I feel like there could be consensus um, to do something, and it may not be something that we all agree with. So I think that's that's something that both I feel need something needs to be done, but I also worry that the wrong things will be done. So um, that's that's what what I think about what I worry about. David, final comments. Yeah, N- number one, calm down. It's a tool. <laughs> Learn the tool, exploit the tool, figure out ways to make the tool better. And number two, I totally agree with Dan. I'm worried about the tool being used for bad. And I'd love to see SIGGRAPH really take the helm on some of those issues and be the the world place where everybody comes to ask questions and learn how they can um, you know, keep that from happening. Well, SIGGRAPH is not just the executive committee. SIGGRAPH is all the people who are members of the organization. And for all of those who are attending today, if you think this is a valuable discussion to have, then what you might want to do is uh, propose panels, propose talks, propose birds of a feather session at the conference and keep the conversation going. Because nothing's going to happen unless we keep talking, but talking in a positive fashion, as Dan was saying, and talking in a future-looking m- manner. And Blake, you can have you have the last the last word here. All right. Um, so I kind of want to echo what everybody else has said. Actually, um, keeping the people in mind. Right. These are tools, and these are tools for people, and they can be used for very, very bad things. I've I've actually you know, thought of some nightmare scenarios, which are terrifying to me as a technologist have actually disturbed me more than um, any other kinds of projects I've worked on when I thought about what, how bad could it get? Um, But the truth of the matter is I don't think it's going to get that bad, right? That's kind of the worst case scenarios, but we should as technologists and people um, lean into the discomfort this is a very tumultuous technology. It is, it is a divisive technology and that we need to approach it with some reflection. Mm-hmm. Um, we need uh, intelligence and an education, of course, but then also equal parts, compassion and grace for the others around us. We're coming to the end now. I want to thank everyone, Rebecca, David, Dan, and Blake for an I think a fabulous discussion. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ed. Okay. Well, thank you guys. This has been an awesome evening. I really appreciate all of our panelists, all of our attendees, all the comments that I've been reading. It's it's just been great comments. So everybody give yourself a round of applause and uh, we'll see you next panel. <laughs> <laughs>